All right, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the Bible study. Uh, my name is Brother Dion. I'm a part of our hospitality team. Uh, uh, we thank you for all of you, you know, coming and joining in today. Uh, as Pastor Scott will be teaching on World War Me, um, you know, as we are in this battle against ourselves, uh, we're going to be open up, opening up with prayer by Sister Jessica, and then the intro will be uh, read out by uh, Brother Emmanuel. Uh, so just open your hearts and minds to this prayer and to this word, and we just thank you guys for joining in with us today. Good morning. Let's bow our heads for prayer, please. Our Father and our God, we salute you today. God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for being kings of kings, Lord of lords, Father. We thank you, God, for being an ever-present help in times of trouble. We thank you, Lord. And we begin that you gave us a new week to begin, Father God, and we just thank you. We ask that you would speak to our hearts and you would just prepare us, Father God, for your word that um, we could just be inspired and be encouraged that um, we would just hear your word correctly spoken by our pastor, Father. I, that, and also that we would be able to say yield, yield to our hearts, Father God, so we can just take an action of what we're learning, Father God. We thank you. And I also, Father God, want to thank you for our pastor. We ask that the Lord would speak to him and the Holy Spirit just work through him, Father God, and give us a good word like always. And the Holy Spirit would just um, work through each and every one of us as we're hearing the word that is spoken through him, Father God. We thank you for our leader and we thank you, Father God. We, thanks, um, we give you thanks for each and every person that is on the line, Father God, that those that will rewatch, Father God, that we would be all left with a piece of understanding of your word, Father God. And we just thank you. We glorify you, God, because you are mighty. And we thank you, Father, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much uh, for the wonderful welcome, uh, Brother Minister Dion, and also for the um, powerful prayer. Um, Sister Jessica, I'm here to read today's intro. World War Me. If you ever find yourself or even know someone else consumed with negative thoughts, this message is just for you. Fear, worry, doubt, confusion, depression, anger, and feelings of condemnation. All these are unseen attacks happening on a daily basis on the battlefield of our mind. It's true, the mind is a terrible thing to waste, but without the proper defensive mechanism found in God's word, we leave ourselves vulnerable for self-sabotaging damage, costing us both our mental and spiritual health. These traits are developed by negative thoughts and experiences of our past, worldly misnomer, toxic environmental influences, or simply from the lack of knowledge. That being said, it's imperative that we remain deeply rooted in God's word. If not, we too can grow to become our worst enemy, allowing our mind to wonder, exalting itself above the knowledge of God, influenced by those people, places, and things of this world. Only through the knowledge of God's word can one discern which thoughts are of God, that of our own mind, or even those thoughts influenced by the devil. Through the applied knowledge of God's word, we're equipped with spiritual insight, discovering God's ultimate purpose for our lives as the Holy Spirit aligns our will with God's way. In this battlefield of the mind, learn to focus on God's words of affirmation, transforming those negative thoughts of trials and tragedy into victorious living, empowered by testimony. This is World War Me. Over to you, Pastor Scott. Hey, thank you uh, so much, Minister Emanuel. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you all for joining in today. Uh, today's a good day. It's a great day. Every day in the Lord is a great day. And uh, we're excited that you all are, like I said, here. Uh, let's go into the, uh, uh, the word of God. Uh, as you notice today, uh, the title of the message is World War Me. World War Me. The theme is, is that every war uh, generally, whatever name of that war, it identifies the radius of how far the span of that war is. In other words, when you talk about the Korean War, we know that that is a war that took place in Korea. 
when we talk about the Vietnam War, that is a war that took place in Vietnam. When we talk about world wars, we had World War I and World War II, but it, it was an expansion of all these different armies in collaboration that were going against the United States and other countries that were involved. Well, this is entitled World War Me because it covers a spectrum of all over the world and it is the biggest battlefield that there is and that battlefield is in our mind. World War Me, the war that we are facing is the battle with are we going to obey God or we're going to obey ourselves or the world. World War B is, is entitled that way so that we'd understand there is a battle when it comes down to the warring in this flesh. When I say in this flesh, I want you to know something about this darling skin, this flesh of ours that we take so much care of and we pamper and for you ladies, you lotion up and have it very arrayed, very beautifully. But I want you to know for a surety that there is a substance in your flesh and in my flesh that is called sin. Yes, the, there is sin in the flesh. And whoever controls the person's mind is whoever is going to be the one we yield to. The Bible says it like this. Whoever you yield your members to, that's who you are a servant of. So you should know this. God has a will for us. The devil has a will for us. And then we have a will for ourselves. Whoever has the most influence that can influence our mind, that's who people are generally follow. So when I say World War Me, let's talk. Let's just talk. When we talk about World War Me, we talk about me. What kind of issues do people have when it's talking about yeah, themselves? Yeah. I'm not talking about the devil at all, just with their own selves. Let's see here. Um, Elder Angel Baird, what kind of problems do people have within themselves? What kind of problems do we have? Oftentimes we uh, struggle with feeling inferior, uh, feeling not good enough. Mm -hmm. Um, oftentimes um, struggle with uh, fear, fear of rejection, fear sure. of failure. That's very good. Let's, let's deal with some of these here. Fear of rejection, fear of failure. Let's see. Um, how about with uh, Brother Dion, Minister Dion, have you ever had a fear of failure and how did it feel? Um. Yeah, it happens all the time, and it doesn't feel good at all. Mm -hmm. what, what type of things provoke fear of failure? Um, I'd say <clears throat> you can put a lot of pressure on yourself to become successful when you don't come from success. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. Fear of failure. Uh, Sister Jessica, when you hear about fear of failure, what does that mean to you when you hear about fear of failure? Something that you're just trying to to accomplish mm -hmm. and you're just not getting to where you need to get. And you're just feeling that that fear that you can't accomplish anything and you're just not pushing yourself to get where you need to get. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. Now. Sure, because that fear is real. And believe it or not, many times we all at times suffer from sabotaging thoughts. In other words, just because we think a thing does not necessarily mean that it is that way. But sometimes we are so used to not having success, it becomes fearful. Now I know a very successful person here. I've got Sister Star here. She's very successful, just had a promotion. But Sister Star, I know you had an interview uh, for your position. And before you got the position, how did you feel when it came down to possibly not getting that job? How did it make you feel? Well, you know what? I, um, in another interview a week prior, and I actually didn't get that job, so I was disappointed. Um, but God always had something else lined up for me. I got mm -hmm. a interview another the next week with another location, which was closer to home. So I think it's important to know that if God says no, it's always something better for you. I mean, yeah. 
Yeah. Now she's talking from an advanced person been in the Lord a while. Because when you've been in the Lord a while, you can say those things. But the reality is a lot of us still have fears. A lot yeah. of us still have insecurities. And when you have fears and insecurity, uh, it, it, it affects you. It affects our mind. It affects how we look at things. And yeah. let me just say this. A lot of that things that affect us will affect our physical body also, even though they're mental. Let me ask somebody else here real quick. Um, I'm just, just going to get real. I got Here's a brother, Corey. Oh, got Pastor, Pastor White there too. All right, Pastor oh, Watts. Minister uh, Corey Watts, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had fears of rejection? How did that deal with you? Fear of rejection. Uh, it's scary. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd be scared to be rejected. Everybody has things and deal with emotions and uh, to be rejected is not a good thing. Yeah, yeah. It can be very scary. And don't you know, it's all right to be honest. One of the things that I notice as a, a pastor, as a man of God, is that there are times when I myself have certain fears. I have certain insecurities. I have certain anxieties about things. And you know what? I think sometimes we do a disservice to others by making it look like the higher you go in God, you don't have any of these fears or you don't have any of these worries or concerns. But I want you to know, I'm just as human as anybody else. I'm just as real as anyone else. And even though I know God is on my side, but there are times because, and this is just called life. There are times when we fear being rejected. And if we didn't think about it, now just think about it. When a person feels like they have a fear of rejection, uh, Minister Emmanuel, how does it make you feel? You ever felt like you were being rejected by people you really wanted to respect you? And how did it feel? It's like, it could be traumatizing like, yeah. and prevent you from wanting to, um, you know, open up and, um, you know, open up and progress uh, when it comes to anyone in the future. Okay. Yeah, it can be very scary that way. Let me ask you, I got my, my other friend here, uh, Kiari. Uh, I, I was about to say Minister Kiari, but uh, he'll be that in, 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 in uh, due season. So Minister Kiari, have you ever felt uh, rejected? And how did it make you feel to just know you were being rejected by people that you really wanted to respect you? Yes. Um, the question, Pastor Scott. I think, in, in my opinion, when it comes to rejection, I take rejection as something that I can view as either something that's against me personally or something I can use to grow from. Mm -hmm. Rejection, even in situations where I have been rejected, I try to identify what God wants to teach me in that moment, but also how can I identify anything that may have been brought to the light in that rejection and help mm -hmm. myself so yeah. I don't get stuck in the personal part of it, but how can I develop or more a better you know, man from that state. Of that. Yeah, absolutely. Let me tell you something. It is a disservice to try to prove to people that I am so strong when in obvious there are times when we really do feel weak. The Bible says it like this, in our weakness, he, which is God, is made strong. There are times when God will lead you to a situation that is above your pay grade, above that you're able to handle, but he will always make a way to escape. The problem with us as people is that the way to escape is not necessarily the way we want to go because it doesn't look like sometimes with God, God can uh, present himself to be mysterious to us. And it'll be like, Lord, I don't think, I don't wanna go this way because anybody who knows if you've been in God long enough, generally the life in Christ goes like this. It initially starts and it goes down and then he raises you up. The Bible says it like this, there first must be humility and then honor. Sometimes, what we don't want to do, we don't like to do is humble ourselves because to humble ourselves means that we don't have the answer. I have to submit. And if I submit, I have to say that I'm submitting to whoever or whatever that is that's greater than me. Unfortunately, when people submit to God, a lot of times they're submitting 
is only according to what they see in others. And that's where another problem comes in. Unless we get in the word of God and take the word of God in ourselves, then we're not going to fully fulfill what God really wants for us. Because how can you know a purpose if the very thing that gives us a purpose we don't get into. So it is important, it is imperative that we get into the word of God so we can fight off these battles that go on in our mind. Because if we don't fight these battles in our mind and we become passive, I guarantee you the devil is going to come in and he's going to take and have his way in our life. So let's uh, go into this word of God. And I want to be able to talk about an individual uh, and what took place in this life in order to relate it to us. So uh, let's go, if you don't mind, to 2 Kings. Uh, we're gonna be in the actual seventh chapter of 2 Kings. Seventh chapter of 2 Kings. I'm gonna read some of these scriptures here. Uh, and it, like I said, it's gonna be very unique. And one thing while you're getting there, I want you to know about God. God always uses extremities to be able to show his power so that if he can work it out for people having situations that we probably may never face, we should be able to trust him in it also. So again, I'll be, going, I'll be uh, reading from 2 Kings, the seventh chapter, beginning at verse number one. It reads as follows. Then Elijah said, hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this same, about this, this, about this time, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then, then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, behold, if the Lord would make the windows of heaven, might this thing be? And he said, behold, thou shalt see it, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. And there were four leprous men at the entering of a gate. And they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now, therefore, come and let us fall into unto the host of Syrians. If they said, excuse me, if they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight and go into the camp of the Syrians. And then when they, excuse me, and when they were come uh, to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of great hosts. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel have hired against us king of, uh, of the Hittites and the king of Egypt to come upon us. Last verse, verse number seven. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and they and and left their tents and their horses and their asses even the camp as it was and fled for their life so here's a very unique situation there's really going to be two situations that i want to tie in to this this actual story so you can understand what we're talking about this mind of ours and the battlefield of this mind which is the world war me so here it begins the seventh chapter. And in the seventh chapter, uh, the servant Elisha, who was the understudy of the prophet Elijah, had come to see this king. The reason he had came to see the king of Israel is because they had a particular situation taking place. And what that situation is, is that the children of Israel were surrounded by the Syrian army. And the Syrian army was great in surmountable numbers above the children of Israel. So that is called a siege. Whenever you hear the word a siege, that means that they have surrounded the area and they're not allowing anything to get out 
or anything to get in. Obviously, that means they would not allow them to get any food in or anything out of that city to get food. So they were literally starving them to death. Don't you know, many times, that's how the enemy wants us. He wants us to be at a point where we can't get to where we are nourished. Most of the churches, I'm just going to be real. This is a real talk today. Most of the churches that are out here that I hear about, a lot of them are not feeding the people. And when people are not being fed the word of God, you can spiritually starve. And how does it look to spiritually starve? It looks like a congregation that has no faith. In other words, they simply come to church because it's the right thing to do, but they're ever learning, but never coming into the knowledge of who Jesus really is, nor do they come into the knowledge of what their purpose is. Let's talk about spiritual starvation. Spiritual. Sister Shalita, when I say spiritual starvation, what does that make you think of? Someone that's dying of spiritual starvation. Um, I, th I think of someone who's dying from not receiving the word of God, not, not um, getting, yeah, not getting the, the opportunity to spend time with God. So there's mm -hmm. starvation there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when you talk about spiritual uh, um, starvation, again, it's like our physical body. When we begin to starve, there are certain signs that comes along with starving. Now, most of us, uh, we, we ain't suffering for no, no natural starvation, nothing. We will eat. We will find a way to eat. We're going to find to eat. But the thing is, when you are not being fed the word of God, there are going to be signs just like physically when you are starving and not being. Now, what things does it impair? When you're, let me ask um, Brother Fernando. When you haven't eaten, I don't know if you've ever had, but if you hadn't eaten in about, let's say if you hadn't eaten about one day, how much would you think you could live both hands? Um, I'll say less than what I normally pick, you know, normally I can live. Sure. Now, so imagine, a week. now imagine like a week. Hold on, keep your microphone on, my friend. Imagine you hadn't eaten in a week. How, how much would you be able to live? Nothing in I the week. I can't hear the question. Is like if, if you okay? If you had not been able to eat in an entire week, how much could you lift in weight? <laughs> Probably nothing. Probably nothing. Now imagine spiritually, we have people, and thank you, Brother Fernando. We have people that have not had and been fed the Word of God, and they're trying to because the Bible says. We should lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. But if we can't lay it aside, then we'll be too weak. And sometimes people wonder, why do I keep falling into the same snare, the same trap, the same theme over and over? Because I don't have strength. Sister, uh, Pastor um, Watts. Uh, Cynthia, when you hear about a person spiritually starving, what are certain things you look for and you can see when a person is spiritually starving? A person that's spiritually starving, you know, um, I think that they they lose their faith. They're they're weak, you know. They right. definitely lose their faith. They're weak. They're fatigued. They're tired, you know? um, spiritually, that the flesh is being fed more. Mm -hmm that you do the flesh starts to take over and yes, the spiritual eyes yes yeah. that's it very good thank you so much for sharing uh elder williams what kind of things do you notice when people are spiritually starving what kind of signs do you see in their life also uh they have a tendency they have a tendency to fall for uh, any wind of doctrine, doctrines mm. of devils, doctrines, uh, you know, political stance and making things, natural things, temporal things more important than spiritual mm. things. Mm -hmm. Very good. They, and they feel, they feel strong about it. And they're, they really weaken the knowledge of God. Amen. Thank you so much. Let me say this too. When I look for people who are really strong in the Lord, those are people who are strong in his word. 
You cannot be strong in God and don't be strong in his word. And let me just be for real. Now, this is a real talk again. You can't know God any more than you know his word. There's no way. If, if my father was a billionaire and he died, I don't know what he's left me unless I do what? Let me see here. Uh, Miss, Brother Sebastian, what do I have to find out? How would I find out what my father has left me if he was a billionaire and has died and I'm his son? Oh, you know what? I think your internal, it's your internal microphone that's down on your laptop that actually internal. I'll come back. I'll come back with you. Okay, I'll come back. Uh, T. Archer, uh, that's my nephew. I like saying that. T. Folk. T. Archer, if your father, <laughs> my brother, if God forbid he should ever die and he was a billionaire, how would you find out what he has left for you? Um, I probably would uh, look at a will. If he had a will and testament, most of the time, usually that's the first way you find out. Or mm -hmm. you would, uh, if he doesn't have one, then you would have to probably get an attorney and actually try to figure out exactly uh, how they want to divvy up uh, property or money or anything like that that he may have mm -hmm. left behind. Because uh, since my father has four other kids, he would need to, they would need to make sure that at least he divvied up somewhat fairly. That way everybody yeah. receives something goes from there. Absolutely. Very good. And thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, you hit that right there on the nail. Listen, you cannot tell or know what God have left you unless you get into his word and his word is his will. If I had a father that was a billionaire, I would be like, what? And he's gone. Don't you know when Jesus left that he said, I've left, but I'm giving, I'm giving you better promises? I've left you. I'm going to make you the head. I'm not the tail. I came poor that you could be rich. You mean to tell me that there are people that are rich here right now. And if you don't know what the exceeding riches of his glory is for your life, you might be suffering right now from being poor and left out and dismayed because you don't think that I just don't have the money. I don't have it. What wealthy father would not want to provide for his kids? I don't know, but if you're a good father and our father is good, our heavenly father is real good. Cause he said, if you being natural men know how to give good, good, good gifts to your children, how much more will the father of life give to his children? Especially those that ask them. His word says, if we delight ourselves in him, he'll give us the desires of our heart. But if we don't have the desires of the heart, maybe the problem is not Will God give it? Maybe it's a heart thing. Maybe it's a mind thing. Don't you know, if you don't feel like you deserve a blessing, it's hard to get one. That's true. If you don't feel like you deserve a blessing, then you are. When people don't feel like they deserve a blessing, uh, let me go back in my, my, my friend, Sister Star, have you seen people, they, they, they say they say, but they don't feel like they deserve a blessing from God. How do they act? Um, it's funny. Me and Kiari were just um, discussing, I think, mm -hmm. was it? the night before. And mm -hmm. he was like, you know, why don't you ever get excited about what God has given you? And I was telling him, it's because I know that he can take it away. In it. So I don't like it. So boastful. Okay. But he was to realize God doesn't have to tell them. So you have to show it. And it's funny because that it relates to me. Mm. And I have to know that the blessings of God are from God and that that should be shared. Mm -hmm. I got you. I got you. And another part of that, Pastor Scott, was the thing about showing what God has given us. We also have to showcase that when He takes it away, it's still His will. You yes. have to. Yes. Yes. Right. In that. All right. See, that's why I like you already. I love y'all, right? They had nothing to do with your mama who's hiding over here in the corner. I ain't gonna say nothing about it. <laughs> but look at here. The reality of it is just that. We have to know that, listen, this is my mentality. When I pray about something, 
If it does not change, then it is not meant to change because God hears our prayers. And I know God hears my prayers. And so if he doesn't move, it's because it doesn't need to be moved. Sometimes the actual, not even sometimes, but the journey is always more important than the destiny. Now in this story here, what I just read, it starts out with Elijah talking to this king and in this king, because they had this, the children of Israel are surrounded by these Syrians, this king and the people are starving. It got so bad that they were literally selling bird poop on the market. Not only that, it got so bad that there were people that were taking their children and killing their children and eating them. That's how bad starving. Now, I don't know about anybody on this planet, and especially on this channel, but look here, I'm not going to now have the, if I'm starving, I'm just let me die. I'm not going to kill my kids and eat my kids. What? I don't, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I don't make any sense. No, we're not going to do that. But it got so bad, that's what the people were doing. And the king was at his wits end. And he said, we need a word from God. And he was wise enough to know he didn't have a connection with God. God never lets his people go into starvation and all these other things unless they can get they get out of the will of God. Now, let me just say this. It does not mean you won't have financial problems. I am not saying that. But I'm saying he will never let the enemy take over you unless there's a way of escape that's a part of it. That's what I'm trying to say. So here, the children of Israel got into sin. And because they got into sin, God then allowed their enemies to buffer them. In other words, take over and surround them so they could not get out or in. So Elijah, they get Elijah. And Elijah goes and begins to prophesy to them. And Elijah tells them, by this time tomorrow, the whole economy is going to change. And it's going to change. And, and, and what things were sold uh, for uh, little, you're going to have a lot of much, and you'll have a lot of money, and you'll have all these type of things to be able to pay the bills and everything. Now watch this. Suppose somebody tells you, I don't know if y'all ever been in debt before. <laughs> sure you have. But imagine you had a surmountable amount of debt, a lot of debt. Sister Shay, I don't know if you've ever been in debt because you don't, you, I mean, you're a wise person when it comes to spending. But look at here. So how does it feel to not know where your next bills, how are you going to be able to pay your next bills from? Um, It's no, I mean, it's also kind of, you kind of go back to, okay, what did I spend my money on? Why don't I have any money? You know, and I think it's it's scary because it's all the what ifs. Like if I can't pay this bill, then my account goes negative. And then yeah. if my account goes negative, then they charge you more money. And then this is kind of like a cycle. Yeah, absolutely. And believe it or not, a lot of us ask the question, why God? Why is this in my life? How would this, I'm a child of God. I remember when I was homeless. And one of the thoughts I had was, how does this look, Lord? I'm a child of God and I'm homeless. I'm a preacher. I'm a evangelist. I'm an apostle. How does this look? And I'm homeless. And Jesus said to me, how did it look when I was homeless? I was not doing it for me. I was doing it for you. And if I could go through that, you can go through it also. But you know what I noticed about being homeless? It put me around an environment of people that I normally would not even be going to. It put me in an environment of people that were not having rich words preached and taught to them. So what I did, I found myself witnessing and souls started getting saved left and right. Every place I was going, even though I was a part of the street that I was on and the area that I was on, but because I went through that, it led souls to Christ and their life changed. Don't ever underestimate the power of God because the Bible says like this, the footsteps of a righteous man or woman are ordered by the Lord. God is ordering our steps even when it doesn't feel like we are. Many times it can seem like 
man, I just, I want to have money. And if we don't watch it, we'll go after that money more than we'll go after God. But I want you to know, going after God is always better. That's what Sister Shalita, that's my inside. Going after God is always better than going after the world. And if we will seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all of these things will be added. Now, listen to this. The man says in one day, the whole economy is going to change for the better and everything's going to be worked out. There was a gentleman, a chamberman, who was standing next to the king when Elijah said that. And this man got resounded. You know, have you ever had people speak uh, 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 discouraging words in your life? Have you ever had people say something you couldn't do and you're not going to be a certain person? Minister Watts, how does it feel when people are trying to tell you what you cannot do and they're speaking all this negativity in your life? Man, get out with that. <laughs> That's right. Because you should not want people to be in your life, especially if they're speaking all these negative things. And speaking negative things is a spirit. Jesus said it like this, my words, they are spirit and they are life, which tells us then there have to be an opposite. So there are other words that are spirit and they are death. I'm gonna tell you this here. The reason why a lot of people don't excel in life is because they're around so much negativity, they begin believing it. And if you start believing that negativity, so as a man thinketh, so shall he be. The way that you think about yourself, believe it or not, I could tell people about how they think by how they carry themselves. It doesn't mean you are carrying yourself like you're a millionaire, but there is a theme of having confidence. The Bible says it like this, cast not away your confidence for it have great recompense of reward. If you are confident in God and you know that God is on your side, it doesn't matter what everybody else might think. As long as God's on your side, it doesn't matter. Like Minister uh, 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 Kiari said, uh, listen, when you know that God's on your side, it doesn't mean things are gonna be all sunny and hunky-dory. It can be bad days, but it's a good day when you got a God day and he's in your life. That's the real That's the real deal. You can have a what they call a bad day, things not working out, but as long as God is on your side, he's more than the world against you. So the man hears and Elijah says, tomorrow at this same time, now you know they didn't have watches, but I'm sure there were some people right there said, what? Tomorrow, tomorrow, what time is it? It's about what, three, about three, 325? 325 by tomorrow. That's what you said. This man began to laugh at Elijah and make fun of them and said, if God himself would open up the windows of heaven, it ain't gonna happen tomorrow, player. He didn't say those same words, <laughs> but you understand the meaning. Have you not had things in your life that you know that God told you and he didn't tell no one but you and people thought you were crazy? They thought you was off. Elder Angel Barrett, have you ever had a time when you know God told you he was going to do something and people thought you were crazy? How did that feel and what did you do? Honestly, um, I can't think of a time when I told somebody that God said it and they didn't believe me. Okay, that's fine. But that, that's no problem. I mean, you're just being honest with you. Better than me. <laughs> because sometimes God will challenge us with things to see if we're going to stand up for him. Because a lot of times people, they will say, oh, I knew that was God. Oh, yeah, you saying that after it happened. But sometimes God wants to be, before anybody else says anything, knows anything, you got to believe in yourself and say, you know what? I can't take this victory. I am. What good is it to have an affirmation after it, happened, after it took place? That's not an affirmation. That's an affirmation. That's after it happened. But God wants us to be able to speak up for him and say, you know what? I know I can take this land. Things are going to work up. Elijah, he didn't bite his tongue. He said, by this time tomorrow, the whole economy is going to change. And it was so grievously bad, even though we got an economy and we're going through a lot of things in our economy, but it hadn't been like this. So he tells them it's going to happen the next day. Now, the Bible says it shifts over. It's almost as if God does a pivot right in between this story. 
It's like, Lord, you're not going to finish this story. And all of a sudden, it pivots to four leopards. Who, wait, did they, did they write that right? Did they, you, you write that? They, four lepers. How does that have anything to do with these king uh, of Israel talking about the seeds yeah. that's on the Syrians and people eating their babies? I'm going to show you. God takes four people that don't have any title. <laughs> Sometimes we think people have to have a title to talk and speak on behalf of God. They didn't, the Bible doesn't say that they were evangelists, that they were teachers, that they were prophets, that they were pastors, that they were uh, 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 anything else. All it says is that there were four leopards and they were outside of the gates of Israel. And the reason why they were outside the gates is because this leprosy that they have, which is very and highly contagious, by it being a contagion, it spread quickly. Sound like something in today's society. It spread quickly. And they, what they would do, because there was no cure for it, they put these four, uh, and these were children of Israel, they put them out of the city for them to live separately. Think of it like this. You can have a, 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 a health problem that is of such where you really need to be healed. You really need to be, you really desire to be healed. And there are people who they ain't trying to heal you. They ain't trying to trust God. They ain't trying to believe nothing. They just say, I want to push you away. There are times when you may have certain deficiencies in your life and people are trying to push you away. But don't you know, as we mentioned earlier, if God is on your side, he's more than the world against you. So they're pushed out of now, I'm telling you, this is going to get really good, but it's going to be real. They pushed him out of the actual city. So they had to live there. But now watch this. Remember, there's a siege taking place. They're of the children of Israel. So they are rejected of the children of Israel, and they are rejected by the actual Syrians also. So they are dead, so they can't get food from the Israel, the Israelites, and they can't get food from the Sumerians. So they're sitting there about to die. I want you to know this here. If you're a person that has dealt with rejection, I want you to know, don't give up now. Don't give up too quick. Don't give up yet. Because I want you to know, sometimes God will bring us to the edge of the cliff before he'll move. Sometimes the reason why God doesn't move in our life, because he wants to allow it to get so bad that when he does move, we won't steal his glory. That's the main part. God is not a problem with can he move. The thing is, will he move for us? And yes, he will move for us if he knows we're not going to steal his glory. Watch this. So they are sitting there. There's four leopards. They have this dis-ease. They're being discomforted. If you got a disease or something uncomfortable in your body right now, I want you to know whatever it is, God can move it just like that. It doesn't matter how long you've been in this condition because no different than these four leopards, they have been in this condition for a while. But I want you to know for surely, if God decides to move, it will move just like that. Watch this. So here they are, they start thinking. They're using their mind because you should know there's a torment that goes along with being a leopard kicked out by your own people and then rejected of other people. Let me ask this question. Sister Shalita, have you ever had a time when you've been rejected of people, especially people that you used to help and they reject you? How does that feel? It's disheartening. It really hurts because you, You've been there with them and been there for them, and then they reject you. So, yeah, it hurts and it's painful. Mm -hmm. very, very much. All right. Let me see that. Uh, Pastor uh, White, I mean, Pastor Watt, how does it feel when people that you're trying to help out, because you're a pastor, people you're trying to help out, they are fighting against you, and all you're trying to do is help them? Um, <coughs> it's, it's very hard. Times, you know, to accept that, um, especially early on, starting when I first started, you know, 
you know, pastoring and helping. That's that's my ministry to help people. And you know, you want to see them succeed and and prosper. When a month when they start, re, you know, rejecting and act like they don't want the help, and you've reached out to do all that you can, it's it's very hard. Uh, it's difficult sure. at times. But I learned to have that, you know, because you, know, you do what you can do your best, and you allow God to do the rest when it comes to them. Amen. Amen. It hurts. And if we don't, and I, you know, that's, this is a part of it where I just said, we just got to be real about it. That every single one of us, you just show, if you've been hurt by people, especially people that were close to you, just raise your hand, just slip your hand up there. Yeah. And we've all been through it. But it hurts. It doesn't make it feel good. And when the people that are closest to you, those are the ones that hurt you the most. And if you don't watch it, we'll start fearing and not desiring to get close to people. We don't want to get hurt again. And everybody hurts different. Everyone grieves different. Everyone displays that pain differently. So a lot of it dictates we don't want to be around them. But here these four lepers are, they make up their mind and they start thinking the thing out. Sometimes we just don't put thought into things. We just uh, we just ride that vicious cycle over and over and over, and there's no change in our life, as if it's going to change from the direction we're going, if it's just the same vicious cycle. Some of us have been in the same thing over and over and over, and you wonder, why does this keep on coming in my life? Why does it keep on happening over and over? It's because we haven't made up our mind to move from that place. Sometimes we just have to know when a blessing has come to an end. That's real talk. The, the four leopards are sitting there and they're saying, why should we sit here and die? When, listen, if we go to the camp of the Syrians and who knows if, they, if they'll if they allow us to come in there, we might be able to get something to eat. But if not, they're going to kill us. But if we stay right here, we're going to die. So it, it almost appears to be a lose-lose situation. But one thing they know for a surety, if we stay right here, we're going to die and we'll never know what it would be like if we had gone over to see the Syrians. So they decided we're going to go and we're going to die. Sometimes you got to go for broke. That's real talk. Sometimes you got to get to a point where don't you get fed up and sick and tired of being just told what you're going to do and what's going to happen in your life by others. And it looks like everybody prospering but you. It looks like everybody's getting their prayers met but yours. And it's like, you know what? I've been going through this thing and I'm tired of going through it. So now it's time to do something different. Do something different and just test the waters. Test and see who knows, maybe God might be in that thing that you try out. They go to Syria. They go marching in there and you have to know they're going to, no, 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 no watch this. They can't go to Israel, their own people, because it was their own people that was left there out, left them out there to die. So they're going to a people that hate their people. You hear that? They're going to a people for help that hate their people and want to kill their people. And here they are, not just children of Israel, but they're full of leprosy, a disease but they're going for broke. When are we going to get to that point where we start worrying about what people think about us and say, we're going to do with God. For God, we live and for God, we die. If it's not going to work out, then Lord, I'm going to be like Apostle Paul to live as gain and to die as God. But I am not. I refuse to stay right here. I refuse to be the same way I've been year after year. I've got to now go and try the land. I got to go test it out. I got to go there. They go to Syria, they go into their camp and they're looking, what in the world? They think they're dreaming. All of the Syrians are gone. Thousands upon thousands of soldiers that had them encamped about are gone. I want you to know, and in this week, in the next seven days, and I don't make up stuff, some of you are going to experience a thing where there's something that's been in your life for a while, and then it's going to be gone just like that. Just like that. 
they go to the camp of the Syrians and they don't see any Assyrians. They're like, wait, wait, where'd, where'd the people go? They're scared because they could have been killed, but now they see everyone's gone. So they don't, they don't even know if they're dreaming or not. So they go into a house. And they begin eating, they begin drinking, and they said, you know what, we better take, let's take some goods and take it out of here so that we can go and bury it because we don't want nobody taking it from us. Let me tell you something about being broke. When you haven't had money and you haven't had a lot of things to work out in your life, if you don't watch it, you'll start coveting everything you get. In other words, getting all you can and canning all you get so you can keep it to yourself because you don't want to lose it. So you just, you think by storing it up, it's going to last a long time. But I want you to know for a surety, God is going to be good to us anyway. Storing things up will go against the Bible because a lot of times God wants us to be able to give because he says, if we give, it shall come back to us. The problem with people is we don't like to give. And when we don't like to give, how are we going to receive? The Bible says the Lord loves a cheerful giver. But if you're a person that doesn't like to give, you like to harbor and keep things in, God is saying, wait a second, I got a little problem with you. Because I so love. Loving and giving are in the same frame of mind. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When you love God, you got to love his people. How can you say you love God, but don't like his people, and his people are the body of Christ? Here, the Israelites put these four lepers out, and they took them, and those four lepers go into the Syrian camp, and all of a sudden, they're all gone. And then the Bible tells us what happened is God created a noise that came in the ears of all the Syrians and made them believe that the actual children of Israel had hired all these other uh, other armies from Egypt and also uh, other places that were attacking them and they ran out of the city. They left all their silver, all their gold and all their riches. I want you to know this, when God is on your side, whatever that is that's fearing you fears God. Whatever that thing is that's causing you to fear, I want you to know that thing fears God. And I want you to know when God is on your side again, you don't have to worry because I said earlier, he's more than the world against you. So they go in there and they're getting all this gold. They're getting all this silver. The things that they couldn't get when they were in Israel, they get it all. And then a thought comes to them. Why don't we go and tell the children of Israel? Why don't we go back and tell the Israelites that this land is wide open, that they're not surrounded anymore? Why don't we tell them that they left their silver, they left their gold, they left their garment, they left everything, and you can come and spoil the land? So they went back and told them all this is happening in the same day. What? they did not know is while they're hitting all these spoils from out there from the Syrians, they don't realize that Elijah, the man of God, had already prophesied it, that by this time, the next day, everybody, the economy is going to change. I want you to know there is a benefit of having true men and women of God in your life. It is a benefit. We take it for granted because a lot of times, and let's just be real, there are a lot of men and women that say they are men and women of God, but they don't live according to God's word. They don't live according to what the word of God says. They don't know how to speak life. They speak death. And the other part is they don't know how to build people up. When you are a true woman or man of God, you should know how to build people up. You should encourage people. You should be, people should be looking for you to come, not for you to leave. They should be excited about when they see you coming and they say, that's a real man or that's a real woman of God. Man, I get excited because one thing I do know about being around true people of God, that the blessings of God are going to make rich and add no sorrow. I want you to know you cannot stop God from blessing you unless you stop him right here. 
if you realize that you are blessed and highly favored, it doesn't matter what you're going through because what you're going through is going to lead you to the blessing. Everyone who was a great patriot of God, look at the life of Moses, look at the life of Elijah, look at the life of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all these people, their life was very low at one point. But when God turned their life around, just like Joseph, then that same person who was no more than a common prisoner will wind up being second in, in charge. I believe, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, I, I'm about to call out some more names, but let me just say this here. God will make you their head and not the tail. So when they told the children of Israel, they were excited and they were like, what? You'd mean to tell me that the army, no, it's gotta be a trap. It's gotta be a trap. Let me tell you something. Sometimes God will leave a blessing for you and people around you. That's why you got to watch who you, who you hang around. People around you will sabotage your blessing. And if you sit around and listen to people that have all this doubt, whether you're going to be successful, and whether God's on your side, I want you to know it can pull you down. And I'll say it like this. Whatever that is that slows you down, eventually it will pull you down. And the worst part about it, we're all going to see it. I want you to know, sometimes you just got to say, get away, yeah, just stay away. Sometimes it is your blessing not to be around doubtful people. It is. I don't do it. So watch this here. So they go and they tell the children of Israel, children of Israel hear about it. So they said, there must be a trap. So they said, let's send out 10 people. Let's send them out on horses. to go into that, the, the Syrian, see if you check around that land and see if the Syrians are around there. So they sent out these spies. They sent them out to check out and do uh, excavation or to check out that actual land. And they found out there's no Syrians at all there. And when the children of Israel heard that all their enemies were gone, they like a stampede ran out to get all this gold, to get out. This, this is how we need to be about the word of God because the word of God is full of great nuggets from the word of God to get us the blessings of God, to get us into a place where God can use us. They go running. And when they went running, the man who was standing next to the king who said, if God himself would open up the heavens, they're not going. there's no way the economy is going to change in one day. They ran him over with their feet. Even though he saw that the economy was changed as the prophet prophesied he was not going to be able to enjoy it he died right there on the field so i'm saying all this to you all today world war me is going to be a series not a long drawn out series but a series of battles that we fight in our mind to be able to get and receive all that god has for us the blessings of god and how we sabotage many times our own blessings by what we put into our ear gates and what we think into our mind. So as a man thinketh, so is he. We want to make sure that we get rid of all the stinking thinking, anything that will cause doubt and not be faithful. And the only way we're going to do that, we've got to stay faithful to the word of God, which is our deliverance. That is as far as I'm going to go today. And my prayer is that you all got something from the word of God. I pray that you'll realize you can't put yourself around a lot of doubt. Don't put yourself around people who are speaking negative. Don't put yourself in the environment of you should be the head and not the tail. You should be the lender and not the borrower. I want you to know if it doesn't happen overnight, that's fine. But keep on believing God. Keep on trusting God. And he's going to bring this thing to pass. Amen. So without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and we're going to end for today. I pray that you all will come back for World War III Part 2 because it's going to be serious. Next Sunday, I guarantee you, you will be blessed by the Lord. And for those of you, remember now, look for that unexpected blessing, that thing that you had not been able to work out and see. Somebody's going to have that testimony. I know that, that the thing you had not been able to work out for a while in this next seven days, it's going to work out. Okay. Without any further ado, uh, let me see. How about we will have, how about we have, uh, uh, I was going to ask Pastor to pray. I'll tell you what, come on, Sister Star, pray for us so we end with a word of prayer. Sister Star, 
I didn't hear that. Okay, I want to ask you. Go ahead. You can just end us uh, today with a word of prayer. Yes. Okay. Lord God, we come right now just thanking you for your many blessings, oh God. Thank you for allow allowing us to be on this call and fellowship with one another. Lord, I pray over everyone on this call, oh God, that they have a wonderful day and that the word penetrates their heart. I pray that everyone is strengthened by your word and guided by your word today as we get off the call, oh God. Anything that people stand in need of right now, God, I ask that you cover them, cover the day, cover the week in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so very much uh, for your uh, wonderful prayer. All of you, uh, we will be seeing you all uh, this next Sunday coming up. Uh, this actual tape will be published probably within the next hour or two at most. Uh, again, thank you all so very much. I love all of you all. Uh, uh, Sister Alicia, appreciate you. Sister Lorelai, Sister Alexis, Sister uh, Krelin, Kr 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 Krelinda. <laughs> I always miss your daughter's name, but please forgive me, Sister Jessica. Uh, Sister Monique, all the rest of you all, I do appreciate each and every one of you all. The Kindred family, love you guys. Uh, you know, so I, would, I don't want to overlook anybody, but Thank you all. Love you all. We'll talk to you next week. God bless you now. Bye-bye. Keep me in prayer, too. Bye-bye.